Hello, everyone. This is David Tannenbaum from the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, and we're continuing our series of conversations with David Russell on his beautiful releases of the Bach great lute works. So welcome, David. Hello, David. Nice to see you again. You too. So this is one of the most beloved pieces in the guitar repertoire. Essentially, if you're a classical guitarist, you have a relationship with this piece. And you mentioned in the introduction, your spoken introduction, uh, that there are people who feel there's a religious affiliation with this piece. And I'm one of the people who does feel that. Um, we know that Bach was into numerology. And I think the number three representing the Holy Trinity is just prevalent throughout this piece. Mm -hmm. We have a three movement form that he never again uses, Prelude, Fugue, and Allegro. We have a da capo fugue, again, rare in box output, but a three-part fugue. We have a, a Morden figure that is, is, appears throughout each of the three movements, a three-part motive. We have what's known as the Psi figure, Bambada, a three-part motive. And then we have a key, which is, has three flats, E flat major. And in the, in the Baroque, you know, they associated specific emotions with music. They felt they could elicit emotions specifically with music, sort of like a film composer writing a sad passage for, for a part of a film now. And there was what was called the effect and layer, the doctrine of affections, where they associated specific keys with emotions. And E flat major, one of the emotions associated with that was devotion. So I think that's a pretty good argument for what you were saying, that you know, Bach may well have been thinking in a religious way here. Um, so a key was the first thing I wanted to ask you about. Um, you choose to do it with a capo on the first fret. Yes. And I'm curious about that. Well, one of the reasons is because, because the original is in E flat. And although their E flat was flatter than our E flat, right. uh, it's still, it, it re, it's a representation. It doesn't have to be ton, like tonally perfect. It's our E flat, which is the equivalent of their E flat, I feel. Yeah. Um, that's one of the reasons. Also, we have a lot of repertoire in D and the guitar has a specific sound when you play it with the open D, D tuning. It, it seems to grow in body and things and having it in E flat clears out a lot of that depth that the guitar naturally has when you have, you know, the D-A-D -D ringing there. Now, I know it's simply a capo, you think that wouldn't really change, but it does change the color of the instrument. And I think it cleans up our instrument for all the counterpoint that's happening in the fugue. And in, in the prelude, it wouldn't be necessary, but in, in the fugue and in the allegro, that's like all these notes going on fast, the cleaner it is, the better. And even though I played it in, quite an echoey place, you know. Um, it still sounds clear enough because I think partly the key changed, you know. I, yes. I, I must add something to that because several people have said, ah, oh, the capo, you know, why do you use a capo? I'm going to invent an invisible capo. So nobody will know what key I'm playing it in. So they can't say, why do you, why do you put the capo on the third fret? Why not on the second? Why not on the first? Well, it's going to be a perfect, perfect capo that you will not see. <laughs> Well, the only people who won't be fooled are those with perfect pitch, you know, yes, <laughs> they'll be able to hear it. Actually, along those lines, I have been told I have perfect pitch and I was put in a perfect pitch sightseeing class in school, although I think it's fallible, but um, kept playing with a capo is actually difficult for me because I have to translate transpose in my head, or maybe play from tablature or, or, or get a new score. Um, actually, to go on a little divergence, I have to tell you. Oh, go ahead. You go first. That, that is why you never play out of tune. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Show me a well-tuned guitar and I'll, I don't know what I'll do. Um, you know, I, I just want to tell you a quick thing. Um, I was put in a perfect pitch sightseeing class at school and it was my favorite class in my whole education. And we spent the whole semester on quarter steps. So that by the end of the semester, a half step felt really huge. And I, re I remember to this day one story where we started class and the teacher, uh, there was a, an airplane outside the room and it was descending. So the pitch was coming down and he said, OK, when the when the pitch hits an A, everybody raised their hands. And all of a sudden, all the hands shot up at once. So it's wow. really a wonderful moment. Really? Actually. 
<laughs> so speaking of clean, um, and, and it is a wonderfully um, clean sounding performance, I want to ask you about basis and, and specifically cutting basis. Um, and I'm really prepared for this interview. So people can see oh, here <laughs> in the okay. Frank Kuhn score, I've, you wouldn't believe it. I've got a lot of stuff. Look at the lengths to which Bach goes to specifically cut the basses notationally. He writes three different rests there. And there's kind of an intellectual logic because he's cutting it right at the first non-harmonic tone. But I don't feel it sounds that good to make them that short. And actually, a lot of keyboard players don't make them that short. And certainly, lute players didn't have the right hand capacity to damp. So you do a kind of in-between thing, as I hear. You let some of the longer ones go longer. But I feel like when the harmonic rhythm starts going faster, you clip them a little bit more, maybe to get it lilting along. Is that correct? Okay. Um, it, the, the, the three bars of the beginning, that statement, again, number three, but that statement, which comes in different keys, there I leave the bass right through most of the bar, usually more or less three, three quarters of the bar, um, or two thirds of the bar, actually. Uh, and even the one that is in B, uh, and there's a big stretch, B on the guitar, okay? Uh, there's a big stretch to keep it on your B. I, I make the effort to do that so that that theme has the bass ringing. Then the next part that comes straight after that, the basses are coming um, slower, less, sorry, faster, sooner. But uh, about halfway down the first page, the basses then come every every beat. Yeah, there we go, right down at the bottom. Okay, so, and there I do exactly as bar. That is, I stop, I stop it on the third crotchet. Yes. Quavers, the third quaver, the third eighth note. As you we know. say eighth note, yes. Yeah. So, so it goes ba, ba, one, two, off, one, two, off, one, two. Now that, that because there the bass is moving much faster, uh, by shortening it, shortening it, you can make it more obvious without having to hit it. Yeah. Because and the fact that you stop it actually makes it stand out. Right. And it also cleans up the harmony so that the next harmony can come because the harmonic rhythm there is, is four times faster than it was in the beginning. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So that, that, that's the way I, I, I worked it through because it's nice to have a kind of uh, a logic to it, whether that logic then translates into the interpretation, who knows. But we need the logic. You yes. Know, so a little bit like the numerology, say you're going to play the beginning of the Chacon. I don't like to put all those extra notes in because it no longer works with the numerology. Hmm. And probably as far as the general audience, the interpretation wouldn't matter. But for me, it matters. And the of same course. I, 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 it, this reminds me of Mozart, who said, I want my work, my music to work for everybody. But the more you know, the more you get. Yeah. You know, so there will always be audience members who are really tuned in to the details. Yeah, that's right. I mean, they're tuned in. But I think also if the player, the interpreter is, um, has more than simply, I like this tune, <laughs> reason for playing it. You have more reasons. I think you play it better. Yeah. You can play it with more conviction. So that's, that's why it's worth studying all the in-depth history surrounding a piece of work. At work. Yeah to get closer to the composer's intent and also to have your own conviction and commitment. I, I think that's right. One more thing I wanted to ask you about the prelude. Um, in an earlier video I saw in the part where we come to this wonderful little cadenza where it's the flat minor, in your case, a flat minor, Bach himself writes a kind of cadenza and then you did this big elaboration, but in this performance, not. And I was just curious about how, why your uh, thinking changed. Well, you know, sometimes, when you do, like even I've even done right at the very beginning, I sometimes started the piece with a kind of cadenza on the, the bass E flat, right? If you do that in a concert once, it doesn't really matter. But once you put it down on a CD or in a video, um, it's often, it no longer has that the spontaneity because people are going to listen to it several times, you know? And I feel that, what Bach wrote was actually enough. I didn't feel that the chord needed much to it, but sometimes I've done it more and sometimes not. And sure. so that day when I was recording, I just felt uh, I didn't need, you know, the, the hall, the, the church that I played in, and there's wonderful, beautiful kind of like all involving sound. 
uh, you know, if you play it in a dry place, maybe on, when you play that chord, that seventh chord, it actually works better. Then it would just it'd be, it'd be redundant, useless. So, I think it's a wonderful example. You know, people may think classical musicians prepare everything and it's just set in stone, but it's a combination of this preparation, but malleability also that it can change according to the acoustic or the moment. You know, that's the beauty of the thing, I think. So let's move on to the fugue, um, a really extraordinary fugue in its own way. You know, fugue subjects, of course, usually have two distinct parts in them, like beep, 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 pop, 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 pop or, you know, just gonna analyze many fugues that way. And this one has two parts, but it's all in the same rhythm. And it's all within a very small compass of just a fifth. So we have a kind of hook, and then we have a straight line. And it's very chorale-like, it's very singable. Um, and you make it so singable. Um, and, you know, I notice also as you play this fugue, you, you have a lot of flexibility and you're sort of following the line, especially what is known as that sigh motive. Bach uses that for sighing a lot in his vocal music. And you're not worrying about, sh you know, shining this, the spotlight on the fugue subject all the time. You're very content to just leave that in the background sometimes. So I just wanted to ask you about that. Well, you, you know, sometimes uh, I feel that the beginning of the fugue, it is totally necessary to, to really show the voices and show the theme, the subject, uh, and as they come in each one. But then there comes a point where uh, that's almost like the bricks of a building. <laughs> they're, mm -hmm. they're important. They have to be there and yeah. they have to be played right. You can't, you can't mess them up. But there comes a point where you don't want to show that all the time. I, I want to see the rest of the building sure. or the rest of the, the, the structure of the work. And especially the, the, the Psy theme, the, the, the Poggiatura. You know, I, I feel it's such an important part. I mean, it comes in pretty soon. The first one is, is an awkward one that um, physically on the guitar, many people actually play it backwards. They go, because it... it on a score, it would be written as a D, but it's still it's yeah. uh, sorry, as a B. B, B don't, that first one, but I do a funny fingering where I can still make it ring from, yeah, there, you, you've got the score. I, was, sure. I can do go there if we need, I have it right here. But I know exactly what you mean. And in fact, I think it's derived from the counter subject. That, that, um, yeah, da, da, dum, bom, be, dum, be, bom. I think it comes from that. David, the first one that, that has the semi quaver. Uh huh. In tararam, just just in there. Um, uh -huh. Anyway, yeah, uh, right at the beginning. Yeah, just third line. Uh, I think it's. I can't quite read it well enough on your. Yeah, maybe it's hard. Uh, okay, just a little bit further forward, a little bit further. There it is. The last on that line. Okay. The last on that line is the beginning, the the upbeat to the appoggiatura on the line that's just by your fingers. Ah, okay. Now I that got is. You. That is the first sigh. Okay. Now you can take a look at it yourself, David. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Tell me which bar number it is. I, I, it's, I, it is the pickup and the bar number 11. Okay. For the, for the Frank Kuntz edition or any edition, actually. Um, yeah. And it so, comes actually in sixth at that point. Right. Yeah. So that, that one there uh, is the first sigh. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's in that edition, it'll go, and the B, A. Yes. B, A, B, A. Right. But it's actually really awkward. And so almost everybody, you know, almost always hear it cut the other way around. They go, um. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you have there a double appoggiatura, really. And it has to happen. Cut, yeah. yeah, it has to happen. Right. So, so in some ways, you know, when, when you have, say, the structure, hopefully you're not going to lose that. And actually not, you, know, you must play the, the, the theme that's going on underneath or whatever. But if the, the beauty of the actual, the adornment that Bach has given to the piece, if that beauty is not done well, it just sounds bad. Yeah. So I okay. gave it more, more importance perhaps than maybe someone else, but I really wanted to have, and in fact, I, I stretched the, the uh, rhythm just a little bit. I don't want to play it dead straight. So that it hopefully sighs a little more. Yeah, it almost feels like it swells, like bambada. Like if we could, you know, uh, crescendo on it or, or just, yeah, increase it some. You know, and, and speaking of the building of the exposition, it's kind of an edifice that's, that's deceptive in a way because this fugue comes on as though it's a five voice fugue, but it never really has more than three voices after that. And I, I've always loved that part, you know. Yeah. 
Um, so when we when you when we talked about uh, the nine nine seven suite, mm -hmm. there was also an intersection there, and you really very perceptively went a little faster in the middle section. Yeah. But here I didn't notice as a change like that. It felt like kind of the same tempo, and I wanted to ask you about yeah. that. It, it is. It's marginally faster. Right. Well, at least I don't know if I got it that way, but that was what I was aiming at. And it just kind of like moving forward just a little more. And so, and then when the when the first part comes back, I just like hopefully kind of put the brakes on it a little bit to give it the sort of slightly deeper feel yeah. or more heartfelt feel when the theme comes back. Uh, but I, I, because of the hall, I really, you know, I, in some places I've played that noticeably faster, but the hall felt so big, you know, that I, I felt that do -da -ro -da -de -dum -de -dum -do -de -do -de -dum was fast enough. Yeah. If, and, and I didn't want to have the middle part of the fugue compete with the allegro. Ah, uh, yeah. In, Good point. In, in feel, in feeling. I wanted the allegro to feel fast. And yeah. I wanted the other one to feel kind of smooth. Yeah. More notes, but smooth. That's Great. what I was in. Well, let, let's talk about the Allegro. Um, and that leads me to talking about the manuscript a little bit. We do have this wonderful manuscript of this piece. Um, it is put together on just a folded together a uh, couple of pieces of music paper. And by the way, um, that was owned by the Tokyo Museum. Um, and about five years ago, it went out, it went up for auction. Um, I think it was listed at about three and a half million dollars and an anonymous uh, buyer bought it for perhaps more than that. Um, you know, yeah. rich people, they like their things like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, they like their rocket ships. Bill Gates bought some Leonardo da Vinci notebooks. I like the person who spent a few million if they had it on that. <laughs> but you know, um, I, 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 it yeah. was Christie's, I think, auction that I read when it came out, you know, yeah. it's a, pretty pretty extraordinary that you know a score of bach is being sold right and <laughs> yeah and also it was one of the few secular works that wasn't owned and i believe jacob Lindbergh played some of the piece during before they auctioned it off which is ah, you know, the idea. yeah yeah um so it, when we talk about the allegro it's it's just so cool what bach did so if we get to the second the fourth page um of the so what happens is, I just want to get this right because it's so cool. So the Allegro starts about here. I can't see it exactly. But Bach starts writing and he's on the fourth page and he's clearly running out of room. Yes. And he starts writing smaller and then, oops, he's out of room. But the practical musician, he doesn't want to start another piece of paper. So he goes here and he starts writing an organ tablature, not lute yeah. tablature, showing us that he really didn't know the intricacies of the lute. And he finishes here on the bottom of the prelude page. So that's here's right. what he, yeah. and here's the word fiend at the end there. So I just think that's so fun that, that he did that. Um, what I want to talk about a little bit is he does an extraordinary thing. He writes this allegro in 3-8. And he, you know, again, the number three. And yet he bars it in a very interesting way. You can yeah, kind of see that in the, right. Every other bar is a sort of half measure. Yeah. I don't think you'll be able to see that in the manuscript, but you can study that in the back of the Kuntz edition. And you get such a lovely groove going in the Allegro. I'm wondering if you were thinking six or thinking longer, if you were influenced by that barring. Well, there are some parts that definitely work better when you think in six. The, be the beginning, maybe not so vital, but you know that the part that there's a bass line, it goes pop, 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 boom, 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 boom. And, you know, usually we try and maybe staccato the middle one and things. And those work very well when you play them, not every bar with an accent. So it pop, 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 boom, boom, pop, pop, boom, 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 boom. It, it works better. The whole the whole passage works better rather than emphasizing every single bar. It's every second one. So it's really there. It's six eight. Yeah, eight. very much uh, feels that. Yeah, and then there are places where it felt more like twelve, even where you were going four bars at a time. You know, which is wonderful. I mean, the phrasing was that way. You know, because because. But like towards the end, there's a long, a long, long passage where the where the bass line again is is one two three down two three one two three that going down and that is a one big long passage and so to cut it up in, or to think of it broken up, I don't like. To, I prefer to think of it as a full. Yeah, part. I think that's that's him finally 
in a way showing off the, the ingredients of this whole piece because the motive dee, dee, ba, do, dee, 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 is actually happening upside down and and forwards dee, do, dee, da, do, dee. and it's in the top line and it's going down by measure um diatonically by step which is of right. course the line from the fugue it's like the grand finale of the fireworks show there i think that's you know? right yeah <laughs> Great. so you know, any, so much, go you're ahead so much, david you're fantastic I, I i love it when you talk about the piece with the you you have all the enthusiasm that i feel as well i, I like just it. love this piece so much and it's you know as with the great bach works it's just a, a lifelong study it, it's the gift that keeps giving you know i think so david thank you for your very beautiful performance of this of this great chestnut of the repertoire and i look forward to the next one okay and i look forward to meeting you again like this sounds great bye, -bye. bye for now <laughs>